Uh, James 1, starting in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray together. Mighty Father in heaven, the book of James tells us that you are a God who gives liberally wisdom to those who ask and who lack wisdom. And Lord, we come to you uh, feeling our lack and wanting you to teach us by your Holy Spirit. And so uh, we pray that you would um, uh, be our teacher this morning as we look at the opening of the the book of James, but also in these months ahead as we study this book. Would you uh, lead us to the things that we need to hear and that would uh, shape us as your people and and lead us deeper into uh, knowing Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, this this morning we're beginning a study through the book of James, and uh, we'll be studying this book through uh, the summer months through through August, and the passage that we're looking at uh, together this morning really gives a great introduction to the book as a whole. And so this morning I'd, I'd just like to give an overview of the book of James. And to do that, I, I want to just answer four uh, simple questions for us. And this is what they are. Who wrote the book of James? Who was it written for? Why don't some people like it? And what does it have to say to us? So as an introduction, four questions. Who wrote the book? Who was it written for? Why don't some people like it? And uh, what does it have to say to us in, in Bellingham? in 2020. And, and, you know, I'd encourage you as we're coming into this new series, maybe you consider in your own personal devotions to read through the book of James. And if you uh, don't have a habit of reading the Bible on your own, maybe you've never done that before. Book of James is a great place to start. It's short. It's, uh, it's practical. It's uh, powerful. It's, it's pretty easy to understand, but, but beautiful and poetic. And so I'd invite you as we're getting started to read the book of James on your own. And and, uh, I'll be praying the Holy Spirit uh, opens this book for us and and that it's fruitful in in our lives. So four questions this morning. And the first is this, who wrote the book of James? And you might think the answer to that question is obvious because right there in verse one, it says James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. So you say, well, didn't James write the book of James? Well, yes, but there are actually three James, Jameses in the uh, the New Testament. And so the question is, which of the three uh, Jameses in the New Testament wrote this book? Well, uh, the most well-known of those three is James, the son of Zebedee. And he's the James that you read about if you read through the Gospels, that, uh, who was one of Jesus' inner three closest friends. And he was there on the Mount of, uh, Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus wa- was transformed and, and his glory was revealed to, the, to, to Peter and John and James. And then James was there when Jesus raised a young girl from the dead. And... Um, But James was martyred fairly early in the life of the church. In in Acts chapter 12, we we read that he was killed by Herod. And so scholars say it was likely that he was killed too early to write the book of James. So it probably wasn't James, the son of Zebedee. There's a second James, James, uh, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, And we know almost nothing about this James. He he is one of the 12 disciples that appear in the lists in the Gospels, but there are no stories written about him. Calvin did think that this James uh, wrote the book of James. Um, But traditionally, the church has said that James was written by a third James, who was the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. I think there's a, a lot of good reasons to uh, agree with the, the church's tradition. And, uh, and what do we know about James, the brother of our Lord? Well, a few things that I, I want to point out. First, 
The James who wrote this book was not a believer during Jesus' ministry. Actually, in, the, in John chapter 7, uh, it says that uh, Jesus' brothers were kind of mocking him and telling him to go up to the, the Feast of Booths and to go show everyone his miracles. You know, you should show everyone your miracles and then they'll start believing in you, Jesus. And John makes the comment that for not even his brothers believed in him. So James didn't believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. And, and at the crucifixion, when, when Jesus was killed, Mary was there, but it makes no mention of Jesus' brothers. And in fact, there's a, another scene in the Gospels where it says that Jesus' family thought that he was out of his mind. And you kind of wonder, you know, maybe James is a younger brother and, and Jesus gets all this attention and he had all these followers in Galilee. Maybe he was envious of his brother. And uh, for whatever the reason, he wasn't a believer. And I think that's an important point because the book of James is a challenging book. It is a book that calls us to obedience to Jesus. And, uh, but James knows what it's also like to have a life of disobedience. He knows what it means to have your life changed and that a person can change. And uh, so the question is, well, when did James start believing in Jesus. Well, that's the second thing we know about him. Not only that he was not a believer during his ministry, but second, that he saw Jesus after the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul has a great chapter on, on the resurrection. And there's this list of the witnesses who met Jesus after he was raised from the dead. And, and it talks about the disciples and it talks about some other apostles. It talks about a, a group of 500 people. And, uh, but James is also mentioned there. Jesus meant, made a point to go visit his brother, reveal to him that he was alive and James saw him. And maybe that was the the thing that really changed his life and, and he became a believer. And you imagine, you know, the shame that he felt after God has revealed, this is my son. This is the one who, the savior of the world that I've sent. And he's been mocking his brother and saying he's out of his mind and he doesn't believe in him. And he's not following him. Um, but this is the mark of all the apostles, that they were men who had experienced grace. You know, Peter was that way. Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus restored him. He had received grace. The apostle Paul was, had, had persecuted Christians and he received grace. James too had, he had also received grace. And this became, their lives became a picture of the gospel message that they were presenting for the forgiveness of sins and to come and receive grace in Jesus. And this is what God does, is that he takes broken, shamed sinners and they meet Jesus and their lives are transformed. And you know what happened to James? Well, there's a third thing that we know about him is that he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And the Apostle Paul, actually, when he became an apostle, he went to Jerusalem to kind of confirm that he had the same, been given the same gospel that the apostles had. And it's said that he met with the pillars of the church there, who were, it was Peter and John and James, who was a pillar, who gave Paul the, the right hand of fellowship. And James played a crucial role in what's called the Jerusalem Council. And some of you will know that we're a Presbyterian church here at Christ Church. And what that means is that uh, we're connected to other churches regionally and nationally so that three times a year I meet with other pastors to, uh, for what's called presbytery, these presbytery gatherings. And then once a year we have general assembly and we come together and we uh, debate theology and talk about church business and church issues. And these same kind of gatherings happened in the early church. And one of the most famous is in Acts 15. It's called the Jerusalem Council, where the elders of the church gathered uh, in Jerusalem. And they had this question about, okay, the church is, has both Jews and non-Jews who are coming together as worshipers of Jesus. And they have these different customs and these different laws. And you have all these laws of the Old Testament. How are they going to be, you know, the body of Christ together? And, uh, and the motion that was brought, that brought the Jews and the Gentiles, the Gentiles and the non-Jews together, that solved this problem at the crucial moment in the de development of the church, that motion was brought forward by James. The Holy Spirit spoke through him this way to keep the church 
unified. And so he's one of the great leaders of the early church. And so uh, he was not a believer, but then he met Jesus in the resurrection and his life was transformed and he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But being the leader of the church in Jerusalem also is connected to a fourth thing that we know uh, uh, about James, the author of, of this, this letter, is that he had a close relationship with Jewish Christians. And James was a traditional Jew who had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So he maintained his loyalty to the Old Testament law, even as a Christian. And you'll find the mention of the law at a number of places throughout the book of James. He calls it the perfect law, the royal law, the law of liberty. But he sees that the ethical teachings of the Old Testament law were perfectly fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And you'll see, you see that there in the opening verse where it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fulfillment of the Old Testament, the, the fulfillment of everything you hoped for in the Old Testament found its fulfillment in Jesus and he saw that. And you know, that's one of the things that I, I find fascinating about James that he was a traditional Jew and his whole world had been turned upside down when he realized that you know, Jesus was the Messiah and J Jesus was welcoming into his, into his kingdom all these former pagans who were so different than the Jews. And so James had this great leadership challenge, holding together these different people, Jews and former pagans, without compromising his deepest convictions. And what you find throughout this book, you know, how did James do that? What you find throughout this book is really a reflection on that great commandment from the Old Testament, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he had been loved by Jesus. And he'd worked out loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's really what the book of James is, is the whole book's about. And so, so who wrote the book? Well, it was the, the half-brother of our Lord who, uh, who rejected, did not follow him during Jesus' ministry, but, but met him in the resurrection. He had his life changed. He became a crucial leader in the, in the early church. And uh, he represented the Jewish Christians of the early church. And through his devotion to the law of love, he held together a young church that have, could have easily been torn apart. And so when we understand who James was, it helps us to understand uh, the answer to our second question, who was it written for? And two answers that we see in these opening verses. The first is that this letter was written for scattered Jewish Christians. The letter was written for scattered Jewish Christians. And you see again in verse one how it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. The 12 tribes, of course, means the Israelites. And the dispersion means the Israelites who had been dispersed throughout the, the Mediterranean. And so James was likely written to Jewish Christians who had been forced to leave Jerusalem or now scattered throughout the Mediterranean. And we know that uh, after the early church leader Stephen was martyred, he was killed actually under, under the supervision of the Apostle Paul before Paul became a a Christian, and it says in Acts eleven nineteen, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. These Jewish Christians from Jerusalem had fled persecution, and so their pastor James was writing to them to help them you know, find their way in this strange new context of the Roman world, away from their home in Jerusalem. And that's why this letter begins in, in verse two, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing your faith produces steadfastness. James is writing to people experiencing great trials, counseling them, how to face hardship. And we know that actually in the middle decades of the first century, there was, um, there was a great famine. There was a lot of economic distress in the Roman world during this time, which means that this is really a perfect book this summer for us to be reading. Uh, as our world is deeply unsettled, how do we walk 
through the trial, the economic distress that we are all facing right now, how do we walk through it in obedience to the Lord? Well, that's what James is about. That's the letter for us. That's what we're going to be talking about. And so who is, it, who is the book written for? Well, it was written for these scattered Jewish Christians. But, you know, a second answer to that is really that James was written for the universal church, uh, which means it was written for us. And, you know, some of you might ask, well, if it says that it was written to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, that seems very narrow, like it's written for Israelites. And, you know, it has, they have a specific context to them. Well, let me, uh, let me just take a little bit of a rabbit trail here in answering the question, what's the relationship between the Israelites, you know, God's people of the Old Testament, and the church that we read about in the New Testament? Well, you know, in American Christianity, there have been two main streams of thought about this. On the one hand, there is uh, dispensationalism. Dispensationalism views God having parallel purposes between Israel. God made all these promises to Israel in the Old Testament, and those promises are still in effect. Israel is still the people that God has purposes for, and then he has separate purposes for the church, for the body of Christ, and he has promises with them that are, and both of these are kind of unfolding throughout history in parallel to one another. And so, uh, you know, this is part of the reason that many American evangelicals, you know, have a, put a, a large emphasis in their, their kind of uh, political policy about our allegiance to the nation of Israel to this day in the Middle East. And so, you know, this theology has a lot of political ramifications. Well, in the same way, the other view, there's dispensationalism, the other view, which is called the replacement theology, says that the new covenant has superseded the old covenant, and therefore the church has replaced Israel as the people of God. So instead of saying God has these parallel purposes, it's saying that Israel is no longer the, the people of God, and the church is, and that's where God's purposes are. And of course, that has political ramifications as well. And sometimes this, this theology will, will cause people to, um, you know, align their political policy with the Palestinians in the Middle East. And so where is our church? How do we view the relationship between Israel and the church? Well, we believe neither of those. Uh, we believe that the historic theology called covenant theology, which is the, the Reformed tradition and Presbyterian tradition. And in covenant theology, it says that Israel is the church of the Old Testament. There has always been one people of God who have looked to Christ by faith for salvation. And that the promise throughout the Old Testament was that the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world, would be engrafted into Israel. And uh, that's what the promise of the Old Testament says. And so that's how the Apostle Paul envisions it. So when he writes to the Romans, for example, he says that the gospel is first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. We have been welcomed in. And, and what that all means is that we who are all, who are Gentiles, have been brought into Israel through Christ, the true Israelite. And so we share in their dispersion and their scattering. We are a part of the 12 tribes who've been scattered. And Israel's story has become our story. The story of Abraham and of David and of the exile and the prophets and the promises. So when James says that he's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, we read that and say he's writing to us. Through Christ, we've been brought in to Israel. And the promises of Israel have become ours. So who is this letter written by? Well, it's James, the brother of Jesus, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And who's he writing it for? The scattered Jewish Christians that, have for, that he had been pastoring in Jerusalem who've now been scattered around the Mediterranean, but who we identify with and we have become a part of. So he's writing to the universal church. But you know, uh, the book of James has not always received, you know, the reception that it deserves. And so this leads to a, a third question as we do our introduction into the book of James. Why have people not liked the book of James? Why have people not liked it? And the history of the book of James in the church is interesting. You know, it's often been neglected. Uh, if you look at some of the earliest lists of New Testament books, uh, for example, the Muratorian Canon is a, a fragment that we have from the second century, a list of, of, you know, what books 
Christians saw as scripture, and James is, is left off of that list. And, uh, and it's not so much that people rejected it and said, we don't think James should be uh, in the New Testament. It's just they don't even mention it. It's almost like maybe some of them didn't even know that it existed, or certain parts of the church didn't know it existed. Um, so we're not sure why it was neglected, but later in Christian history, during the time of the Reformation, James became much more scrutinized. And because Martin Luther, who launched the Reformation, had discovered the gospel of justification by faith in Christ alone, that we, we are justified, we're received, we're accepted by God because of what Christ has done, not because of our good works, but because of his good work on our behalf, that we're saved by grace through faith alone. This is what Paul says. But then Luther discovers this, and then he comes to the book of James, and in chapter 2, 24, it says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, the relationship between what James says here and what Paul says in, in Romans and Galatians, we're going to cover that when we get to James chapter 2. But because of this, Luther called James a book of straw. And he even considered whether maybe it should be removed from the Bible. He wanted it at the end of the Bible, though, which I think is crazy to me. And so what is it about James that, that people had a problem with? Well, a couple things. First, they said that it's short on the gospel. James is short on the gospel. They say it's, it's basically ethical teachings, but it doesn't proclaim to us the grace of God in Christ. And uh, maybe you'd think that from just reading these opening verses. It says in verse 4, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So here James is saying that he expects our lives to be perfect and complete. And you might say, perfect and complete? No, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. I need his forgiveness. And I need his covering of me. But, you know, even in these opening verses, we see that actually the gospel is present. The gospel is undergirding what James is, uh, is saying. Um, uh, and in fact, in the very next verse, in verse 5, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, uh, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. God gives generously. God is gracious. God is loving. God does not, you know, add reproach against people. He's not, you know, hammering on people. And, uh, and later in, in chapter 4, verse 6, he says, He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I think as we really study the book, we will see consistently how James is calling us to obedient lives, but an obedience that flows out of the grace of God that is ours in Jesus. And so first, they say it's, it's short on the gospel. It's not. It's not short on the gospel. The gospel is woven in. It's assumed. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's accompanied. All the calls to obedience are accompanied with the grace of God. But the second thing they say is it's not only short on the gospel, but it's also short on theology. And people have said that James, you know, again, it's largely ethical teaching, but there's not teaching about who God is and redemptive history like the Apostle Paul does. And uh, James is the book of the New Testament that's most focused on Christian living. But theology is, is woven into it. And he's always insisting that our theology not just stay in our heads, but it gets worked out into our lives. That's what's important to James, is that we live our theology. So, for example, you know, there's the doctrine of God. In chapter 2, he says, you believe that God is one you do well. And what he's affirming is the, the oneness of God. And this is from the Old Testament sh uh, uh, Shema, which is, it comes from Deuteronomy. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's saying, okay, I'm affirming your theology. But then he goes on and says, even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be sh shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? How does the fact that you believe that God is one turn up in, in your life, in your good works. You need to believe in the supreme oneness of God and then let that shape your life. Or take another piece of James' theology, the doctrine, not just the doctrine of God, but the doctrine of, of final judgment. 
He's frequently warning us about final judgment in the book of James. Chapter 2, he says, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over ju judgment. Chapter 3, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Chapter 5, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. And then later, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And so the doctrine of final judgment is attached to almost every instruction about how to live, about caring for the poor and, the, and wealth and money and about the words we speak and about our relationships and community, about the integrity of keeping our word, about the goals we set for the future. Final judgment should be shaping all of our life, is what James says. And so for James, theology shapes life. So when you read the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul will spend the first half of one of, one of his letters talking about the gospel, talking about theology, explaining things. And then in the later half, he will give you kind of instructions on how to live out the theology that he's taught you. James instead weaves it all together. With both the gospel and theology, for James, both are woven into our life. And maybe the reason some people sometimes don't like James is because they want to keep their theology and their life at a distance. And James refuses to let us do that. And so that leads to our final question. So who wrote the book of James? It's Jesus' half-brother who didn't believe in him, who, who at the, after the resurrection became one of the leaders of, in Jerusalem. And who was it written for? It was written for the scattered Jewish Christians who are suffering and are under trials throughout the Mediterranean, who suffered persecution, but it's also written for us. And, and why have people not liked it? They say, well, it's short on the gospel and it's short on theology, but that's not true because the gospel and theology and life are all woven together in the book of James. And so what does it have to say to us? Well, as much as people like Luther have been critical of James, uh, my experience is, is that probably more than any other book of the Bible, I've had normal, just kind of everyday Christians say to me that it's one of their favorite books of the Bible. I know my wife Shannon has mentioned that. James, she loves the book of James. It's one of her favorite books. And I've had many of you say that uh, to me. Why is that? And I think it's because the book of James is practical. It's kind of like the book of Proverbs. You ever read Proverbs? And actually there's a number of parallels between the book of James and Proverbs. He quotes it and he uses similar language. There's verbal parallels. And as much as our philosophy of ministry here at Christ Church majors on the grace of God, that you are embraced by God, not by your good works, but because of the work of Christ. We insist on that here at Christ Church. But still, once we receive that grace, we want to know how to live. How do I live out my faith? And the fact that James weaves theology into life means that he's speaking to something I think many of us really long for, that I want Christ in my whole life. And so don't think uh, that this is just some throwaway comment at the beginning of the letter when James says in verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though James doesn't have long theological passages about the meaning of the cross and the resurrection like Paul does. There is no other New Testament book that has been uh, more influenced by the teaching of Jesus than James. James is filled with the teaching of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul almost never quotes Jesus. James is quoting Jesus all the time. And even in this first passage, what does this sound like? You see verse 4, what I read earlier. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What does that sound like? That comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father uh, is perfect. And there are at least 11 other references just to the Sermon on the Mount in this short letter. And I think the reasons Christians love the book of James is because they hear the voice of their Lord and Master in it. His words, His instructions. And they long to be taught and discipled by Jesus. And that is what is offered to us in the book of James.
And I believe that as we study this book together, Christ himself will be woven more deeply into our day-to-day lives, and we will learn what it means to have our whole life shaped by him. Let's pray together. Gracious Father in heaven, we praise you for your holy word. And we pray over uh, these months as we give our minds and hearts to the, this, the letter of James, would your Holy Spirit press the gospel deeper into our lives, weave it into our lives. And if there are areas of our lives that remain hidden, isolated from our theology, would you close that gap as we hear these words? And so would you guide our minds, um, guide our conversations as we give our hearts to this book. And may your Holy Spirit be our teacher, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.